as we talk about this topic today, I would like to ask you to think about this. The men and women that we care for, occasionally when they come to the post-acute or long-term care setting, they have a perceived sense of loss. Now, that loss could be that they had to leave possessions at home when they moved into the nursing center because, you, you know, you can't take a four-bedroom house and squeeze it into uh, a one-bedroom apartment. So it's kind of hard. So maybe it's possessions that have mis been misplaced. Or maybe it's not possessions. Maybe it's a sense of being able to choose. You see, when you're at home, you and I are at home, we choose when we wake up in the morning. We choose when we take a bath. We choose what we eat, when we eat, how we eat it. We could eat it standing up or laying down. We have a lot of choices. And when you move into the long-term care environment, as, a, as an elder, you might have a sense that now your choices are less. I, I'd like to give this example to really illustrate my point. I had the privilege of serving our country in the United States Army. When I went to basic training... Um, I, it was my first time away from home. It was my first time experiencing a whole lot of things. One of the things that I remember most though, was the fact that now instead of being eight people, which was what was in my house, there were 359 other folks plus me. And we had 12 shower heads. We had 12 potties and we had one bedroom. And, and so it really did change some of the things that I experienced in my life. For example, I'm a guy who occasionally likes to take a bath. Well, we had 12 shower heads, not 12 bathtubs. So I wasn't going to take a bath. Number two, um, we, would go to the, we would go to the dining facility, the chow hall, for some of us more common folk. And I would like to sit down and eat my breakfast and just kind of process through it in a relaxed way. Well, over my shoulder, there was a master sergeant saying, hurry up, y'all eat. We got, to get, we got a thousand other bubbas behind you trying to get something for dinner. So that my way of, of, of thinking was modified. Uh, and, and so I use that story to illustrate that when you go from an individual setting in life to a congregate setting, Occasionally, you do have to modify the way you're doing things. That doesn't mean that you lose the ability to choose. The men and women that come to us for care and assistance, are not they didn't sign a document saying, I'm giving up my rights, I'm giving up my choices, I'm giving up my individuality and my ability to be respected and, and to be treated with dignity. They didn't sign any of that. So... When you're working with the men and women that you care for, the first role you can play as an advocate is with them by helping to reinforce, reinforce that they do have the right to choose, that they do still have their rights as human beings, the right to privacy, the right to dignity, the right to respect, the right to choose what kinds of food you eat, when you eat, things of that nature. So that's the first way that you as an advocate can help. The second way that you as an advocate can help is when you're interacting with your fellow nursing assistants, your fellow caregivers, please avoid the temptation to assume that when you see something that's out of the ordinary, that it's because people don't care. It is more often than not, not a matter that they don't care. It's a matter that they don't know or they don't understand. So as an advocate, when you see something like, for example, when you see somebody who just, they barge right into the room, they don't knock, they don't announce themselves, they don't explain why, why they're there, please take a moment to pull that person to the side in private and say, hey, um, you may have been in a super big hurry today, or perhaps you, you haven't been, um, you aren't aware of the fact that we have um, policies and procedures for how we interact with the men and women we care for. So what I'd encourage you to do is to go to the nurse's station and look at the policy and procedure manual as it relates to dignity and respect for the men and women we care for. 
So in that way, you're not approaching it and, and saying, oh, you're a bad person or you don't care or something like that. You're assuming that maybe they just don't have enough information to make the right choices. So I'd ask you to think about that in terms of advocacy. Uh, I'd also ask you to think about <clears throat> there's a difference when Jeff Wellman, who's normally a good guy and who delivers great care, does something one time and when two or three folks do that same thing repeatedly. And, and so <clears throat> when you're looking at something that concerns you, uh, look and see uh, what the scope of that is. Is it a widespread thing or is it an isolated incident? Because if it's an isolated incident, you want to handle that with, uh, with a different approach than if it's a, a, a large scale problem. Let's say for the sake of discussion that you're a caregiver and, and you just recently came to a new nursing center and you notice that a lot of the nursing assistants, when they're transporting residents who are in their wheelchair to the dining room, they'll pull them down the hall as opposed to pushing them. And you say, hey, you know, that really doesn't seem right to me. So be careful not to assume. The first thing I would do is I would go up to one of my, my fellow nursing assistants who's doing that, and I would say, hey, what, you know, this is different than what I've experienced before. What is, what is the policy and procedure say about assisting, assisting residents to the dining room or to activities or whatever when it relates to the fact that they're in a wheelchair? Is it okay to pull them backwards? Give them a chance to help you understand why. Now, they may say, it's none of your business, you do you and I'll do me. And in, in which case, that means then you probably ought to go to a nurse leader and say, help me understand the policies and procedures. I just want to make sure I'm doing it right because the residents deserve that. Now, um, so you want to take the time to get to know that and you want to call things out, but you don't want to stick pe poke people in the eye because that is not going to help your cause. Remember that in one of the earlier seg episodes, we talked about the fact that one of the reasons you act as an advocate is because you want to win the hearts and the minds of the people. Well, it's a whole lot easier to win the hearts and minds of the people when you're offering them a cup of honey as opposed to when you're offering them a cup of vinegar. So please keep that in mind. So we talked about advocacy with the, the men and women that you provide care for, and we've talked about advocacy with your peers. It's also important to think about advocacy as it relates to the other departments within the care setting. So activities, social services, um, environmental services, dietary, all of those different folks who all work in concert, hopefully, to deliver exceptional care and exceptional quality of life. So when you're dealing with a department that's outside of uh, the nursing department, the first thing I'd ask you to think about is what is their, what are their roles and their responsibilities? Because remember that each of us brings something unique and interesting to the table that nobody else does. For example, um, how many CNAs spend eight and a half hours of the day in the, in the laundry room washing, folding, and prepping clothes. So the, the laundry folks, they might have a very different way of approaching care, but it doesn't mean that they're not, they're not approaching care. So the first thing I'd ask you to do is think about your, your fellow caregivers who aren't necessarily in the nursing department and what is their role, what are their responsibilities? The next thing I'd ask you to think about is, is what they're doing um, in keeping with the organization's policy, procedure, and culture. In other words, is their behavior normal or is it outside of the norm? And if it's outside of the norm, what's the best way to help bring them into the norm? I'd also like to ask you to think about the fact that um, sometimes when you see something happening, let's say for the sake of discussion, uh, that you're going down the hall and, and you see an elder who's, uh, who's sitting quietly in the corner and then a few hours later you walk by and you see that same elder still sitting in the corner. Um, 
you might ask yourself, well, is that a normal part of that person's individual behavior? Is that part of their daily routine? Or is this a so something out of the ordinary? You might stop by that elder and say, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything I can get you? Would you like something to drink? Would you like something to a snack or something? And that's a way for you kind of to spot check. And that wasn't a really great example of what I was talking about with the ancillary departments, but I kind of circled back that way because I, I, I'm not really a one trick pony, but I could tend to be that way. Um, but when you think about the ancillary departments, um, first of all, understand their scope of, of practice or their responsibilities, and that'll better help you help them to be the best people they can be in the process. Now, when it comes to advocating for your elders, there's also a place and a time to share your thoughts with your center's leadership, the director of nursing services or director of clinical services or whatever that person's title happens to be, or the administrator or executive director. And when you have a concern that you're sharing with them and expressing with them, I really encourage you to focus your comments on number one, facts, because facts matter. Number two, to focus your comments on what does what do the center's facilities, policies, and procedures, and the regulations, what do the what do those documents say about the issue that you're concerned about? And then focusing it on I believe that the best way to meet the intent of the policies and procedures and the regulations and all of these things is to do these things. And if you focus, if you frame your comments with those leaders in a constructive way and show why it matters, they're going to be more likely to be active and supportive. So to that point, I would like to um, reinforce, not because I want us to necessarily live in a world of compliance, but because I want us to understand what the regulations say, I'd like you to acknowledge and I'd like you to take a quick look at this excerpt from the state operations manual that relates to the residents' rights. Our residents have all of the rights that they had in their own homes. And the reason that the regulations are created is to help us remember that the resident didn't give up their rights when they came to our care setting. Now, let's take a slightly deeper look at those regulations. So the first thing is that our elders have a right to dignity and respect. So what does dignity and respect mean to you? What dignity and respect means to me is, number one, treating people as I wish to be treated. So I wish for folks to speak, with, speak to me in a pleasant tone of voice. Good morning, how are you? How was your evening? I wish for people to ask me, would you like to do this or would you like to do that? As opposed to hearing, you have to go down to the shower right now. I've got four people after you, let's go. So that, that, those are examples for me personally, and I imagine they might also be expectations for the men and women that we care for as well. Also, when I think about dignity, I think about being treated as an adult and not as a child. Um, I, when I very first entered long-term care um, in, in, early in early 1990, I remember a person describing the care that we were providing uh, as if though we were providing care for a bunch of newborns. And the thing is, is that there's a difference between a newborn who, who doesn't have a very large vocabulary and a grown man or woman who has seen more life than I have. And, and so I, I, when we're interacting with folks, let's be mindful of the fact that while their life situation may have changed to where they require a level of support and assistance, that doesn't mean that their dignity and their humanity has changed in any way, shape, or form. The next thing to keep in mind is that the men and women that you care for, they have a right to be informed. They have a right to be informed about 
the quality of care they're receiving, the kind of care they're receiving, why they're receiving the care, and what the expected outcome of that care is. So for example, let's say for the sake of discussion that you are working with a, a person um, who has put on a substantial amount of weight. And let's say that they're asking for uh, a bowl of ice cream every two hours, 2QH. Well, maybe it's not in their best interest to have that ice cream every two hours. Now, that doesn't mean we don't give them the ice cream every two hours. It does mean that we probably need to visit and help them understand this is a choice you can make. It may have a consequence, and that consequence may be instead of losing weight to get you to a healthier place, you might gain more weight and your cholesterol might go up and this might happen. So communicating with them, helping them to understand, but that they have a right to information. And that information is something that we should be continually flowing to them and explaining to them. Every time we go in to provide care, even though we've seen Mrs. Johnson five times a day for the last 800 days, and we know her and we know her, we know her children, we know her grandchildren, we know her best friends at the Canasta Club. We know all of those things about her. Every time when we go in to deliver care, we need to approach it as if though it's the very first time. We need to take the time to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what we hope the outcome will be. So that way, that person will be more comfortable with the care that they're receiving. And they'll also understand the why, because one of the most frustrating things um, I imagine for adults is when people say do something and they don't understand why they're doing it. So it's important to keep in mind that the, the right for information. It's also important to think about the fact that when um, our elders come to uh, long term care, the post acute and long term care environments, um, they still retain the right to manage their money. Um, they still retain the right um, to have interactions uh, with the people that are important in their lives. Uh, they still have the ability um, to select the physician that they receive care from. They have the right to um, kind of create their own schedule. So like, for example, um, I'm the kind of guy that really likes to take my shower first thing in the morning. I get up, I go into the restroom, I take care of a few essentials, and then I hop right into the shower. So when I go to the nursing home in about 15 years or so, God willing, um, I want to be able to take my shower first thing in the morning. M one of my best friends, Lisa, she is a night owl, and so she really prefers to take her shower at night. So for those people taking care of Lisa, it's in your best interest to let her take a bath at night because if you don't, you know what they say, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, Lisa will give you that reason to, to not be happy if you don't listen to her. So it's important to think about that. Um, it's also important to think about in terms of residents' rights, how we can work as advocates on their behalf to try to make things as comfortable as is reasonably possible. And we might do that. Um, I had a, a, an elder that I worked with, or actually two elders that I worked with early on. Um, one really liked the environment to be very cold. The other one really liked for the environment to be really, really warm. Well, it's hard to regulate the temperature to satisfy both people in a room, in a two-person suite, very hard. So one of the ways that I advocated for those two folks was to, to talk to social services and say, hey, look, there's a lot of conflict happening between these two people. And the core of that conflict is one person wants to freeze to death and the other one wants to burn to death. Maybe what might make sense is to try to find them different roommates so that they can have something that's more desirable. So that's a way that you could think about advocacy. So I want you to keep in mind res the resident's rights. I want you to keep in mind the policies and procedures within your organization. And I want to really encourage you to, to constantly be seeking to advocate, to speak up for, to support the men and women that you care for in the way that is healthy and, and constructive and helps to achieve the desired outcomes. 
Um, as we finish up today's episode, I'd like to ask you to think about something that Dr. Martin Luther King said. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. The men and women that you care for, I know you agree with me that they matter. And because they matter, we can't remain silent when it matters. I look forward to seeing you during the next episode.